accomplish effective detachment so that we can escape the wave of corruption that is coming like a storm. We ask that you strengthen us with might by your spirit in our inner man. And cause your face and the light of your countenance to shine upon us. Father, let us not miss the outlets of mercy that you have made available for this season. Oh my God, let us not miss it as a nation. Let us not miss it as individuals in the name of Jesus. We trust you to accomplish beyond that which we can pray about. And take all the glory and the praise in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Please make someone welcome. I believe this is our first convergence for 2023. Hallelujah. All right, turn your Bible with me quickly. I have a burden on my heart. Uh, maybe by tomorrow morning I will submit to the team of the conference. But at this time, I need to convey a heavy burden upon my heart. Genesis chapter 2, beginning from verse 8 and verse number nine. Those of you that traveled from far and wide to be here, you will not go back the same in the name of Jesus. And in fact, it's, it's a price to conquer the, the traffic of Lagos. And <laughs> you will not go back the same in Jesus' mighty name. And the Lord planted, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hallelujah. There is a need for us to be able to discern and to decipher. There is a need for us to be able to probe and to ascertain right in the middle, in the midst of the garden, in the middle of the garden, there were two trees that stood conspicuously in that civilization. And Adam was supposed to exercise his power of free choice to determine his lines of development. If he eats of the tree of life, he will become a creature that is absolutely dependent on God because he will not have the powers to know the things that are evil or good. So he would need to depend upon God for God to provide a, a, so many functions that he is not capable of producing. If he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he will be perpetually independent from God. He will need to learn how to survive apart from God. Even though these two trees seem to be located close to each other, they are revelations of two distinct spiritual realities. And when during the time of my little prayer, I said that God would need to give unto us the grace to discern and to decipher. It is because of what I found concerning these two trees that were domiciled in the midst of the garden of Eden. We are going to begin a little probe, a Bible probe, into the realities of these two trees, and we'll do it in an in-depth fashion. The reason why we need to sustain this labor is because I found out in recent times that there's so much mixture 
in the body of Christ. The things for which people that know Jesus will weep about are the same things for which so many people rejoice about. The things that are supposed to be rebuked and quarantined are celebrated on hyper tones. And so it is needful for us to take an inventory in the light of the true metaphors that are represented by the tree, the two trees in the Garden of Eden. And we're going to probe along a few lines. The first line of probe is source. The second line of probe are principles. Third lines of probe are laws. Fourth line of probe are kingdoms. Fifth line of probe are lines. So we have source, principles, laws, kingdoms, and lines. Now, if we launch this probe, you will be able to detect if you are dealing with life or death. You see, theologically, God wanted to be very gentle with the identity of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, actually, the name of that tree is the tree of death because the other tree is the tree of life. But you see, death manifests as a knowledge that has the capacity to make man independent. The definition of death, theologically, is not necessarily the cessation of life, but separation from God. So the judgment, the sentence that comes upon a personality that becomes a partaker of this tree of knowledge of good and evil is independence from God. It is separation from God. So his state is a state of death. Do you understand that? All right. So we have a few um, parameters by which we are going to occasion our journey of discernment. If you want to prove, because the Bible says that we should test all things and to stand by that which is good. Amen. So if you want to conduct a test, the first test you are advised to begin with is the test of source. Uh, if we are going to probe according to source, it means that we'll need to travel beyond face value. We'll begin to travel beyond um, lingo. We'll travel beyond uh, oratory powers and probe to see what substance uh, is the premise of inspiration that is responsible for the utterance. It's, uh, it's a little deep, but let's navigate with the scripture. Turn your Bible quickly to the book of John. Uh, the first line of probe we are attempting is the probe of what? Source. John chapter 8. John chapter number 8, verse 44. Sauce. You want to get married? Don't fall in love quickly. Find out the source of the personality that is coming into your life. Because whether you like it or not, the person's source is going to influence the atmosphere around the house. Now, you need to go beyond beauty, beyond intellect, beyond the height. You know, those parameters that we normally check if you are becoming interested in a person. Hallelujah. The person must be fair in complexion, must be from a noble state. Now, we need to probe source. <laughs> May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. All right, this is Jesus speaking. If you have a red letter Bible, this presentation is supposed to be in red. He said, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. 
stop there. Come with me. How many of you have a, a Bible that is aided with a lexicon? I know uh, Ukbore, you used to have that. So click on off. Ye are off. Click on the word off. Or oh, you didn't bring it today. No, I, I, okay. Someone here, help me. Click on off. Ye are off. Your father, the devil. You see, Jesus conducts a probe. And this probe is conducted on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Jesus uses, uses the word ek. Ye ek, ek, ek. Which means you derive from your father, the devil. You see, Jesus is probing source here. The guys looked pious. They looked sacramental. They looked sanctimonious. But when Jesus came upon the scene, their looks were not factors that were worthy of his concern. He was more concerned about the source from whence they function. And operating in the capacity of discernment, he was able to trace their source to the devil. It doesn't matter how you look on the outside. Jesus is saying, ye are off your father, the devil. And as much as you try to package the devil, you try to make the devil look nice, Jesus is saying that the things that the devil did before, because you have the same source with the devil, you are going to find yourself doing the same things. So if we know the source, then we can understand the things. And if you read the things that are products of someone's life, you can trace it back to the source. That's what Jesus is saying here. Because of the low quotient of discernment in the body of Christ, we are about to suffer a major setback. And this setback is occasioned by our inability to probe things. You see, the devil is smart. And if he wants to sell a product, he's not going to array the product in black raiment. Because he knows that you will not like it. You will think it's darkness. So he would like to array it with sparkling gold. Something that will attract your attention if all of the senses you deploy to understand Satan's product are natural senses, he's going to have his way around your life and get you snared by his product. But not Jesus, because Jesus is going to go deeper than face value. He wants to understand the source, the power that drives this atmosphere, the power that is behind the utterance. The power that drives the life. You will notice that when Jesus uh, submitted himself to the baptism of John the Baptist uh, at Jordan and his identity was unveiled, uh, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Whereas, whereas, Many of us in this place will be concerned about what people drove into this place. The Mercedes Benz S class you drove. Jesus is more concerned about what is driving you because it was the Spirit of God that drove him into the wilderness. There, 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 there is something that is responsible for your motivation, it's responsible for your style and your strategy, it's responsible for what you consider important and what is trivial. Are you there? Or you are not there? <laughs> Hallelujah. Right there, I had a deliverance case on my table. The lady called in from Port Harcourt. She had seen this televangelist on a certain channel and she traced the church in Port Harcourt. She never knew that any church like that existed in the city. Traced the church to the location, attended Sunday service. And the fiery preacher made a lot of impression upon the lady. And she felt like having some time of counseling behind the scene. And uh, when she went behind the scene, joined the queue, followed the protocol, got into the office and 
told the pastor her predicament and the things that she's battling with, the man brought one soap. Strange. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, what was power, his message was tight. His delivery, he was a good preacher, sound preacher. He preaches the kind of things that people like to hear today. And he was good at it. You will know that he did some job behind the scene to catch the attention of the people. His diction was, was okay. His delivery was okay. His handle on, on one or two scriptures to make himself look like someone that was sent by God was actually okay to stage such deception that attracted the attention of such an intelligent woman. But when she came behind the scene, in prescribing a solution for her, her predicament, the first thing he brought was an ancient soul and how that she needs to have her bath at uh, the foot of the ocean. Oh, desperate to see her problems attended to, she yielded to the ceremonial bath in the night and all kinds of, the demons that began to trouble the lady for which she located my address, they were not existing before the bath. <laughs> you are not following that. You see, she, she did not bother about source. Her bondage crept in because she was not conscious of source. Her invitation to the preacher was his manifestations on the pulpit. And he seemed to have an, the ability to know things supernaturally. And she was quite interested in this ability because the guy came out with so much detail on stuff. And what even convinced her further was that her friend that she came with, that she knows, the guy picked on her and traveled with revelation over her life. And she is aware that the things that he said were accurate. of things began to take place that she did not understand. She ran to the man again and said, what is going on? Ah, he said, you already blessed. The, the spiritual power that is behind my ministry has already began to attend to. It will come like a mystery. And after some time, you understand this reading and then you know how to flow with it. You see, she was not concerned about source. And this guy was already leading her to become a partaker of something that she would not have been able to enter if she was in her right senses. She didn't need so much discernment to know when to take her journey. But the long and short of the story was that the deliverance case ended up on my table. And then when we began to plow the matter in the spirit, we began to plow the matter in the spirit, ah, then I found that the siren that she had submitted herself to by, by that ceremonial bath was a high-ranking spirit in the kingdom of darkness. The game changed instantly. The moment insight about what she submitted herself to began to come out. And the Lord began to give symptoms about the workings of that spirit. And she confirmed every bit of those symptoms. Do you know, just like healing can be instant, and healing, sometimes healing can take a process of recovery. You know what I'm talking about? In the same way, deliverance can be instant. And some cases can take a process of recovery. As what was that case that did not go instantly. And we battled over that matter for a long time. to her life as a lot and portion. She will gladly accept it. Her predicament began because she did not probe, she was not concerned about source. 
false. False. Hallelujah. Walking with the wrong source, you will be plying on the wrong path and you will end up with the wrong result. Now, the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 13, and verse number 14. Are you there in Matthew 7, 13, and number 14? Just turn your Bible quickly. It says, Enter in. At the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Now, I like to tell you about the way of life. The way of life is straight. The way of life is narrow. In the way of life, the options are not many. For instance, if you, the moment you get married, your options are not many. Even though you are very angry and you lift your hand to invest a slap, now let me give, are you still following what I'm talking about here? The option, you see, you will think twice before investing that slab because you can't have a side cheek. It's narrow. Eh? You will, uh, before investing that slab, let me take you on a thought path that will bring you to an understanding of the fact that you are better off without that investment because the options are not, it's narrow, it's narrow. There's not so much you can do about that matter other than to find ways for peace, ways for settlement, ways for partnership. There are many things you will lose just to gain that alignment. You will lose many things. The way you used to do things, you will stop doing, you say, I don't take rubbish. You will take plenty of rubbish. You will take a lot of rubbish just because you know that the options are not women. You see, that's how the path that leads to life is. It is constricted and what? It is not. When you find guys that are at liberty and they have so many options, here they are. <laughs> you see, it's suggestive of the fact that That's good. So, when we packed in the orientation night, you know, he, he locked the door and said, are you aware I'm older than you in ministry? I said, I'm not arguing about that. I'm not arguing. I'm just a young preacher. Of, he said, oh, yeah, I've been in ministry for long, and I've found so many things that you need to know. So, shut up. I said, you know, the first thing that he told me, he went, he opened the, the cupboard, and he brought a sack out. I said, this is this still ministry day. See, he has already formed, he has developed his whole message for the whole year. It's, it's in little, little sheets of paper in that sack. That if he has any invitation, all he needs to do is just to pick one at random and he flies with it. That's the first knowledge coming from experience. <laughs> the second insight is that no man can be stronger than a woman. So fornicate. But, wait, ah, you are ready. Calm, calm down, calm down. Fornicate, but don't be caught. Because the day you are caught, the anointing will dry up. When you hear narrow doctrines like that, narrow wisdoms like that, it is an indication of the fact that the source 
is suspect. Because the Bible says, are you still with me? The Bible says that huh? narrow is the way and what? Which and straight is the gate that leadeth to life. Somebody made me so angry. That's about eight years ago. So I now went to Jesus. I told Jesus, I said, can you let us just fight one time. This matter is not a big matter. If we can fight, just we'll finish this issue permanently. He said, you can fight, though, but your wilderness journey <laughs> will be extended. You will labor more in the wilderness to learn. It will mean you need to take more courses in my school. Your time of graduation will be adjusted. You will have extra year, spillover, all kinds of papers, but you can have your fight. I won't stop you from your desire for your fight. Then I now put the fight here on the beam balance here, and then I put spillover, wilderness. It will always point you to the narrow, the straight path. If you insist that you want your broad perspective, he will allow you run on that perspective, but it will be more difficult for him to trust you. Yeah. He will need to take you through some purging, some, some firing before he can trust you. But if you decide to choose his way, the narrow way, it means that you want to be built up in life. There is only one merchandise that we have in the body of Christ, and it is called life. And if you are walking on the path of life, the gate and the way will reveal that your walk is built on life. Are you there? So the first thing that we need to know about our walk in life is that the source determines the way and the result. It determines the strategy and the result. So if we look at your strategy and we consider your strategy deeply, we will know what your source is. That's number one. To take God as the source of your life is to follow the constricted way that leads to life. The constricted way. And when we talk about the constricted way, we are talking about the constraining power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. You know, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost, huh? have you ever experienced it before? Maybe you wanted to travel and you felt a strong constraining power compelling you not to take the decision that you have made up your mind to take. How many of you have experienced that? That's how the workings of the Spirit is. It, it, it comes with constraining ability. Are you still with me? I had an invitation to preach somewhere. It was a great meeting, a meeting to be desired. And when I pray about the meeting, I feel, no. But it's a great meeting. I know people that have preached there. I pray about the meeting. No. So, well, because I did not know what was happening in my spirit, I sent them a message. I said, maybe I can come next year, but it's obvious I can't make it this year. Well, they say, it's all right. We'll be ready to accept you next year if you are willing to come. In fact, let us make a deal and book the dates. I went to pray about the next year again. Then I, I said, well, uh, can we just forget about this meeting? Let, let's just be brethren. And when you want... <laughs> let's, just be, let's just be brethren for now. And when you begin to follow that constricted way, people will call you a Jew. They will, they will look for a name for you. Because you are not willing to be part of the clique. You are not willing to be part of the club. Meanwhile, that's the way of life. It will constrain you... It will, it, will, it will put you in a position where many times your understanding will be unfruitful about the reason why you need to do the things that you are doing. If your life is not strange to yourself, you're on the broad path. Because by the time you begin to walk that path that is constricted, because that is a sign that you have eaten of the tree of life and the powers of the tree of life are beginning to enforce there are, there are regulations upon you. Are 
Are you with me? You see, um, a lot of ministers in my own locality, my small space there, a lot of ministers um, consider me a, pers a personnel of oversight over their lives of ministry. So one of them was bold enough to come because of probably, pro probably because of my commitment to preaching holiness and all of that. So he was convicted one day and he showed up and he said, I've been in this struggle. I said, ah, if you are in this struggle, this struggle is an ancient struggle. And only the Holy Spirit can help you out of this struggle. And no, one, no man that is not adequately determined can gain freedom, can gain liberty from this struggle. So it is advisable for you to make it an emergency. And if you are making it an emergency, you are going to leave the pulpit so that we can focus on it. It's a big, it's a big, it's a big trouble. So I showed him examples of people that did not make that trouble an emergency and how they ended up in 15 years, in 10 years, in 12 years. Uh, the common denominator was 10 years. The full effect of dwelling in that era will take full-blown manifestation in about 10 years' time. So we discussed the matter, and he was willing to hand over to his wife. He'll be attending meetings where his wife will be preaching. And then we will work on the matter. All right? And um, he went somewhere else, and then they counseled him otherwise. Went to another elder in the in territory. I said, why are you? And the elder suggested to him the Broadway. But the Broadway was an option. For those of us that travel on the path of life. Are you there? I, I know it will be difficult for you to say amen, but I feel the Lord wants me to do what I'm doing here tonight. Are you there? So he went for counseling somewhere else to second counsel. You know, these days, just like <laughs> you visit a hospital and they come up with a diagnosis of your condition, and you, are, you say, no, 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 no. Maybe they are not specialists in this area. So you visit another hospital, and they subject you to lab tests and all of that again. So he went for a second counseling opinion. And the second counsel opinion suggested to him that the Broadway was an option. So he was still doing that stuff, and he was manning the pulpit. Five years later, he discovered that his congregation had improved on, his, on that matter. The matter was widespread. There was so much grace to operate in that area. And the reason was because what he was doing as ministry was releasing the spiritual ability to operate in that area. The source was already contaminated, and it was going to contaminate the entire congregation. But he didn't see it coming. He just felt, you know, it's my thing. If the people are looking for God, they'll find him, irrespective of me. That's not the truth. And a great, as I speak to you now, that even though the guy has eventually decided to subscribe to my ancient old school council and he's making some progress but the congregation it will take the hand of jesus uh, even even me i don't know if that congregation can be free the reason is because they, they were exposed to that contamination for years if you know how delicate our assignment is our calling is you will ensure that you follow the path that is constricted because that is how the way of life is like if you are still with me say amen, amen. number three on source god is concerned about the source of things matthew chapter 15 verse 12 to 13. God is concerned about the source of things. Hallelujah. God is concerned about the source of things. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou 
that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Next verse. And he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father had not planted shall be rooted out. Say, are you, don't you know that you need to be di diplomatic when you're around these people? They were, they, were, they were not happy by your blunt speaking. I was expecting that Jesus was, oh, I, I, I didn't know. Oh, okay, next time I won't do that again. He said, every plant. You see, the way of life, you don't understand. I'm showing you the way of life. The way of life cannot admit compromise. The, the, yes, the way of life, thou will show us the path to life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy. Do you realize that that scripture, uh, on speaking about life, he called life a path. What is a path? A path is a road that only one person can walk on part time. All right? Make sure you're on the path of life. The path of life is constricted. The gate of life is narrow. And that means the inner workings of the Holy Spirit as it constrains us again and again so that we escape contamination. And that is what our walk in life is about. So the first thing I'd like us to check anytime we want to probe something is not how elegant it is, it's not how flamboyant it is, it's not how shiny it is, but we need to ask the question of source. The question of what? So. I don't want to go into so many examples. I have seen a little in the body of Christ, tongues. Somebody just started speaking one tongues and then interpreting, and speaking the tongues and interpreting. And I knew that these tongues was not from the Holy Ghost. And the more the person spoke the tongues, the more the Holy Spirit in me was troubled. But you see, I was not given the mic at that time, so we allowed it pass. And it was obvious that the pastor that invited me did not know that those tongues were not of God. The moment I held the mic and I asked the congregation to pray, she picked that tongue again. I asked them to shut up. She continued and then I had the opportunity, I had the moment. I said, hey! And the spirit left her. That was when I was now telling the pastor that, oh God, this thing this lady has been saying is not from the Holy Ghost. Now, he opened his mouth. You know why? She had prophesied, she had spoken that tongue and given prophetic words that the whole church obeyed before I showed up. Listen to me. Listen. The way and the destination will be determined by source. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. She will speak that tongue and then say somebody's about to die and that the church will go on three days fasting and the church will go on three days fasting and the person will still die. So she earned the reputation of a prophet in that company. But as she spoke that thing, I knew that it was not God that was talking. May you, may you heed the constricted one that is on your inside, that constrains you so that you will escape contamination. All right, let's go on. Number two, principles. There's still so much we can say about source, but I just want to give you an executive summary. You can study um, on those lines personally and build a more robust uh, content. And, uh, okay, before we do principles, I wrote an example down, a source example, and um, that is Isaac and Ishmael. Now, if you see Isaac and Ishmael, they are children of Abraham. 
But Ishmael was a product of the will of man. Ishmael was born of man. And because Ishmael was a product of the will of man, Ishmael can partake in natural things. But Ishmael doesn't have the wiring and the capacity to partake in the spiritual heritage that the family has. Isaac was a product of the spoken word. He was a product of the prophetic word. And that prophetic word went forth when Abraham no longer had the ability to produce life. That prophetic word went forth when Sarah's body, Sarah's womb was dead. You know, Sarah was barren as a teenager, but at this time, the womb, the Bible said the womb was finally dead. Even if you take it for IVF, the womb is slack. It doesn't have capacity to hold life. It was a graveyard. That was, it was under those circumstances that the word of the Lord went forth. It rejuvenated the body of Abraham that was dead and also rejuvenated the dead womb of Sarah. That guy was a miracle. He was forged by spiritual powers. And even though he looked so much like his brother Ishmael, his constitution was different. And that is what gave him the wiring and the capacity to be able to hold the weight of the spiritual covenant that was traveling in the family. I'm saying this to tell you that if you know men after the flesh, you don't know them. And so Paul says, henceforth, know we no man, what? After the flesh. We must have to probe in depthly before we can know men. And I assure you of this, even the best of us can be wrong in the discernment of men. Even the best of us. Are you there? That's why it's better for us to have the witness of a community. All of us cannot be wrong at the same time. But if you are isolated and you believe that your that's so sound, we are not doubting it. You are going to have errors because sometimes the Holy Ghost will not, it's not his will to speak to you on the matter. Not because you are in error, but that's just the way it is. The, the prophetic is a body reality. And it can decide to pick on several individuals in the body of Christ and use them to demand pieces for a certain season. You will need to depend on their witness to be accurate. I don't want to go into that. Are you saying me? All right. So, number two principles. This one is longer. And I want to take my time to do this job very, very well. Come with me to the book of John, chapter 15. Verse 4 and verse 5. Just like we have two trees, the tree of life and the tree of death. Uh, if we probe into the source, you will know which one we are dealing with. If we also probe into the principles that they sustain, you will know which one we are dealing with. Is that clear? And I'll take my time to show you the the tree of life. I think that's where I will bring my sermon this evening to a close so that we will now pray and uh, tap into some frequencies in the spirit. There is so much darkness that has risen in the body of Christ in our time. And I will spend many months and probably many years bringing strategic knowledge to the body that is designed to build the discernment of the average believer. Because it's obvious that with the level of mixtures that we have around, the average believer will need a stronger platform of discernment. So we are going to bring knowledge in this area, knowledge, and choke the body of Christ with so much knowledge in the area of deciphering and discernment so that no one will be a victim of the tree of death in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, who is there with me in the book of John chapter 15? Where's my man here? He, he just... He's moved. 
John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. As no branch, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. The principle that Jesus is bringing out here is the principle of dependence. If we are operating on the path of life, then there is an inevitable requirement, which is a requirement of utter dependence on God. At any point in time that you become so wise, so smart, uh, that you don't check with God anymore, you don't seek his face to find out his own perspective on matters, and you take off like a tornado because you attended Lagos Business School. You understand investment. You know the graphs. You know how to do the econometric projections. And you take off like a tornado. You will meet with opposition, such opposition that is beyond your intellect. So Jesus is, is calling on his disciples and telling them that the principle of dependence is the principle of life. Now, are you there? Are you with me? Even Jesus himself, before he chose his disciples, he went on prayer and fasting. Because he wants to abide in his father so that the wisdom that will drive that decision will come from his father. When last do you, do, did you shut down and say, okay, I'm going to take a fast? Not because your congregation was called into a fast, but because... You were in a, a place in your life. You were a place in a place in your destiny, and you needed God's perspective on issues. So you decided to abide in Him, so that He will be the one that will give you the enlightenment, the activation that will sponsor the decision that you need to make. He said, "No more can He, except He." abide in me. So he's teaching here the principle of utter dependence on God. If I see your prayer life, I will know if you depend on God. If I see your prayer life. If you have discovered a way of existing without praying, it is suggestive of the fact that you have decided to be wiser than God because God prescribed that man will be a creature of prayer. That is a prescription. That's the design for man from the perspective of God. So if you have found a way to operate that negates prayer, that way that you found is actually malfunctioning. You are not operating according to prescription. And you have decided to take a way that is different from the way of life it means that the result that you will get will not be the result of life. Are you there? So it says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. I, I, I know you know that the branches survive, they live off the vine. I'm the source. You are the phalanges. You derive from the source. So if you are not angulated, if you are not aligned to receive impute from me, it says, neither can ye. Are you there? So life has its own principles. Death has its own principles. And I need to show you a few principles of death that we have idolized and is now part of our motivational box. Meanwhile, all of those principles lead to death, lead to destruction. If we want to do life, then life preaches the gospel of dependence on God. So people that understand life once and again, they go on retreats. They leave mainland. They leave the island and they move to the redemption camp. Want to be 
disconnected as much as possible. Hallelujah. They want to be disconnected as much as possible from activity. Do you, do you even have the power to shut down your handset? The other day we were asking some people to shut down. It was as if there's... That's, that's the power of a believer. He doesn't even have the power to shut down his handset. That's how, that's how addicted to distraction we are. And the Bible says, you, ye, you cannot accept by me when was the shut down and said this phone you know i used to like those phones those days that you could remove the battery from it just remove the battery because sometimes you think you have switched it on it, it just went like this so but when you remove this army the battery and you throw it somewhere look for it after three days God will look from heaven and see you and know that this one depends on me. And dependence is a principle that is associated with life. Independence is the principle that is associated with death. So if you begin to lose your vital connection with the vine, you can no longer access the promptings that comes from the vine and you are still living on. It means you have switched and there's another source that is driving you i just pray that you will not continue on that path for long because if you are not hooked up to the vine vitally you begin to trivialize some things that you held there previously and if you are a preacher of the gospel i advise that you go back 10 years down the line 10 years into history and listen to what you preached 10 years ago get your current sermon listen to it and then you will find out if you are backslid or not if you if you veered off into the broad path or you are still on the constricted path and on the straight gate abide in me all right so let us i did a study of the entire book of romans first and second corinthians and this was what i found about the principles of life Matthew 16, verse 24. First principle of life. Before, I think I should read my script to you before I go to Matthew chapter 16, okay? The principle, number one, the principle of the tree of life is absolute dependence on God. Absolute dependence on God. Absolute dependence on God. When you begin to wait on the Lord, do not give God a prescription of how he should speak to you. The spirit has its language. Part of his language can be pictures. Pictures in form of visions, pictures in form of dreams. Part of his language is in form of thoughts that are sustained in your heart. Thoughts that if you probe with scripture, you will see that they are in line with scripture, but they are sustained. Part of his communications are the verses of scripture that lock on your heart when you are in prayer travels. So you don't prescribe to God how he's going to speak to you. But if you are dependent on him and it is evident that you have no other source, he will look for a way to break the silence and to reach you. But please don't be too hasty. All right? If you know you have no source, sometimes it will test you to see if you have another alternative. If you only have three days to spend, and after the three days you pick nothing, go to work. And then Richard do. Go back to redemption camp. And keep going until you break into the economy of his help. That's the way of life. The way of life is not about changing formulas. The way of life is about staying with God 
until it breaks through and breaks in. I had a young man, I was, I was embarrassed one day because I was a second preacher in an event on a, on a campus. So the preacher came and said, you've been praying, 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 and there's no result. You change formula. Change. Then I had to, I had no message after that because my message was the statement of the preacher. If you keep changing formula, very soon you will not even recognize yourself. Accuracy in the spirit determines that you will not walk in the flesh. So if God has not reached you yet, don't change formula. Just keep digging, keep seeking. He knows that point when you seek him with all your heart. At that point, he cannot resist. He will always respond. So if he knows that no matter how he waits, you will not change formula. It means you have come to the point where you trust him above all else. That's the way of life. That's the proof of your dependence on God. Are you there with me? So, it says the principle of the tree of life is absolute dependence on God. And those who know the principle have no confidence in themselves. Are you there? Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. So he doesn't trust himself to be able to come up with the right position of God's present revelation if he does not seek the face of God and get illuminated by the counsel of God. Okay? You must be in that state where you have no confidence in yourself. Now, I did a theological piece to come and preach during the course of this conference. And then Theophilus began to sing a song. And the moment he started singing that song, the message I prepared for this evening could no longer hold. So my confidence is not in the message. My confidence is in Christ. And I'm going to stand everywhere that Christ is standing. That is a proof that I depend on him always. The way of life is the way of dependence and people that know that way have no confidence in what the flesh so we are going to go through five major principles that is associated with the tree of life are you with me matthew chapter 16 verse 24 you'll find the first major principle first major principle matthew chapter 14 verse 24 then said jesus unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me the first major principle of life which is a principle that is no longer popular in the body of christ is the principle of denying self. And I, I, I need to take some time and explain what it means to deny self. Are you with me? Principle of denying what? Self. So. Uh, it must be understood that the moment man went through the fall, his soul that was supposed to be neutral, that is, absolutely yielded to his spirit to receive from his spirit his soul became bogus what i mean by that is man on the strength of the fall was now sentenced to live by the soul to live from the soul because the spirit was now separated from god the possibility of the spirit linking up with god no longer exists so the fallen man had the principal organ being his soul he was not just a living soul. He was going to live by the soul. So he lives by his intellect. He lives by his human initiative. The day we gave our life to Christ, the status of your spirit was restored. And if the spirit of God is going to have the liberty to operate through your human spirit, and to express himself fully the way he's supposed to express himself, then we have a challenge. The challenge we have is that the soul is already bogus 
and the soul that was supposed to be neutral is now self-seeking and self-centered on the basis of the fall. Are you there? You are not there. For instance, if I woke up to this brother and slap him, he will is the the flesh, his flesh will calculate the number of people here and the number of people viewing online. That's how many people know that he was slapped. And probably the number of people that will watch this video in the next four months. So, say he has a lot of challenge now. And the challenge is to prove to all those people that he's not, he's not, he's not a slack man. So the flesh has advised him. Return that slap. Have you seen, uh, there's something that do, I saw it on Facebook. Somebody will stand there, somebody will come and slap him. Then he will fall. They will be counting. One, two, three. How, how long will he fall? Then he will stand up. He will be like that. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that will happen. He will now advise himself. Meanwhile, it's the flesh that is at work. Because the flesh believes that uh, he is going to suffer loss if he doesn't retaliate. See, the nature of the flesh is that it is self-centered. It, it wants to gratify itself. It wants to um, fulfill the desires of the self, the desires of the mind. That's what he wants to fulfill. But if you are going to deny self, it means when self has packaged the research of the analysis of the situation and has submitted it on your table, you will refuse to walk by self. It's a powerful, it's very powerful. Sometimes when you begin to operate that life initially, are you with me? Just like one guy, he used to use charms. He can afflict anybody that insults him, anybody that tries him afflict them. So he surrendered his charms, we burnt his charm. So his neighbors came, they threw rubbish into his compound. He called me instantly. And he cried on the phone while, while he was talking to me. He said, Pastor, you have made me a woman. Because he was hoping, if, if his charms were with him, he, doesn't need, he knows what to do to those people. But see, there was a provocation and he felt that there was some profit to gain to operate in the flesh. Meanwhile, in, on the path of life, you need to deny that self. So he was yielding to what I taught in Bible study, that he's going to deny self. But he cried and accused me of wanting to make him a woman. It was after the Bible study continued for a while that he, he discovered that that was the way of life. Are you with me? People that know life can walk away after someone insults them. And they don't, they, they are forgotten. People that know life are not trying to prove a point. People that know life can lose in the eyes of men. Just like Satan came to Jesus and told Jesus, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. But I know you know that at the end of the discussion, Jesus did not obey. He didn't turn the stones to bread. So if you were an onlooker, you would say, Jesus lost. They told you the rule. Just turn stones to bread. And you couldn't do it. You see, people that know life can lose in the eyes of men. So that they can win in the eyes of God. So the way of life is a way of denying self. I remember when I was still in the service, there were so many opportunities to do a lot of deals that would have brought me money. Big money. I mean, money in hard currency because we were in a strategic um, sector of, 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 of the economy. But you see, it came easy to me because I've grown a little in life before I, was, I got the employment into that place. It came easy to me. Meanwhile, this is the man that the vehicle I came to Lagos with to be going to work and coming back, they stole it after, is it after one month or something? So I was careless. And there were opportunities for me to rake in, rake in. Hallelujah. So the objective and the voice of the fallen self is seeking to gratify 
So the way of life is to deny the suggestions that comes from the fallen self. That is to say that the fallen nature will, ha will have the capacity to communicate with you 247. But every time you, you sense the voice of the fallen nature, what you do is that you deny. So, because the way of life is selfless. The way of death is self-centered. You get that? The way of life is selfless. The way of death is what? Is self-centered. So Jesus said we should deny self. The next thing he says is that we should take up our cross. Do you realize that cross in that context is particular to you? So what is your cross is different from my cross. Take up your cross. It is your cross, it's not my cross. So what exactly is a cross? This cross is idiosyncratic. This cross is particular to you. This cross is not our cross. It's not a community cross. It is a personal cross. What exactly is your cross? One thing I'd like to tell us is this. If you are going to serve Jesus, it will be at a cost. And your cross is a sacrifice that you will have to pay in order for you to serve the will of God on your life. Are you there? So the price I am going to pay is different from the price you are going to pay. It may be that the price you are going to pay to serve the will of God is lack and hunger. I, I know you don't believe that is New Testament is not possible. Because you have never been to the mission field. That's why you are saying that. I just came back from Kano. I met, I met our brother, um, Pastor Ayo. I met our brother. I had to call his wife. Because his wife is the princess of the Kalaba kingdom. The daughter of the Obong is that brother's wife. And they are in the thick bush. In fact, when they, get, when they go to that place, we can't access them on phone. From the palace to the bush. Because they have the calling of a missionary. And God has used their efforts to turn many people that would have never known Jesus to Christ. And they understand their cross. They are not begging you for money. They know it's part of their calling and they are, they are willing to embrace it joyfully. So I now said, okay, I'm your friend. Because I saw that their labors were genuine. As much as they knew that my, my condition was better than theirs, they didn't ask me for anything. So I'm the one that calls them to, well, seasonally to ask them, how are you doing? What's going on? Any update? So I say, okay, you know what you do for me? Just be giving me updates. These guys know what they are supposed to suffer for Jesus. Do you know? You have no cross. Your cross is traffic. <laughs> then you don't know the way of life. You want, to be, you want to be high in the kingdom of God. You want to be great in the sight of God. For me, my cross is, you know my cross. Because of the kind of witness God has called me to bear, I will be a, 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 a rock of stumbling. So many people will insult me, will hate me, and I'm at home with it. Even my wife, she just sent me a message that that serpent this evening, that serpent must die. I said, you are, you, are, you are still with me. You are still with me. Because there's no way we can play this game easy. My calling is going to bring me on head-on collision with so many evil people. And as I stand speaking to you today, I tell you the truth, I have already signed out my life that if, if on this course I am swallowed up, that is how God wants me to serve him. If you hear that I'm no more, don't weep for me. It is my cross that I'm carrying. 
I know, I know you prophesy that, well, you know, but I'm, I'm just telling you that I am ready. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Or you are not, you, you think I'm faithless. You think I'm faithless. I am ready for what it takes because I'm willing to bear my own cross. Jesus bore his cross and you will bear your cross. We, we don't have our cross. The preacher does not prescribe crosses for people. Your cross is in your calling. And every man that understands the body, that's what the Bible calls a yoke. He says, say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That is, as you learn of me, you will understand his yoke. That's, that's my own yoke and I'm ready for it. And it, it comes easy for me. I'm wired to be at home in tensions. I'm wired to be at peace when many people are arrayed against me. I'm wired. It's a cross. What, what cross are you bearing? Because if you have no cross, it means that you are not on the path of life. It means there are aspects of life you have accepted and there are aspects of life that you have rejected. Are you with me? Uh, the, our brother and sister that I spoke about that they are somewhere in the bush preaching to the sons of the bondwoman, they also understand the doctrine of prosperity. They are very good in the doctrine of prosperity. Okay, imagine. The daughter of the king. And that lady, the guy comes out of the field to do other things. Princess will remain in the field. We were speaking. He told me that if she comes out, maybe she visits home for one week. After one week, she's going back. And nobody could stop her from marrying that man. Even though the parents did not like the idea. But so I now said to him, I want to see this woman. Anything that God did to you, he did a thousand times more on that woman. But we have Christianity today that is crossless. That's the first thing that Satan wants to take away. So that we are just razzmatazz. People without any scar, any mark. I know my cross. And I will not ask you to help me carry it. My children know my cross. They know it. My wife knows it. She can't sleep from morning and wake up, from night and wake up in the morning. No. She knows my cross, so she'll go and beg God and say, this man, help him. Because the moment I leave with my bag, the only reason why we come back is that I fulfilled the will of Jesus and he's pleased. That's why I'm going back. And that is my cross. What is yours? Because the first thing you do after consistently denying self, and you will deny it every day and at every time. For every circumstance, every situation, self has a proposal for you. And you are supposed to be denying it. And this proposal can even be uh, move, move to UK with your family. And it didn't come from Jesus. But you just looked at the parameters, the way Lagos is. Ah, election. Oh! We have left that realm. We no longer do such an analysis. We stay where God wants us to stay part time. Even the devil through the flesh knows that he can, that proposal can't sell. He's already dead. He doesn't have the authority to make us act. Are you with me? Yes. Then don't forget your cross. It's particular to you. If Pastor Ayo comes and takes this mic and preaches and he says, do not commit adultery, do not commit fornication, he will go home free. If I take the mic and say the same thing, do not commit 
my own will generate problem, trouble, crisis. The same message. The reason is because of the nature of my own cross. Do you understand? So we are not the same. I can see that in your own life you don't have my cross. And that doesn't mean, are you with me? Because my cross is mine. It's not, it's not one cross for all. Your cross is built into the sacrifices that you, will, you, will, you have to accept deliberately. Just like Jesus accepted his own cross deliberately. Nobody forced him. He accepted it because he knew it was his. There are sacrifices that are associated with your calling that you will need to accept. Even when you are getting married, somebody is proposing to you, call the person and say, I have a cross. This cross, I will carry it as a married woman. I will carry it after I've born children. I will carry it in old age. This is the kind of woman I am, a woman with a cross. So if you are going to marry her, you need to marry her and marry her cross. Because all sons of light will have to travel with a cross in their destiny. The moment we drop that cross, we become personalities that can work for the devil. We'll preach for the devil. We'll live for the devil. As long as we are not willing to sacrifice, the kingdom of God will not advance. It advances the moment we are at home with the sacrifice that is related to honoring our Lord Jesus Christ. Number four. You know, he said, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Then follow him. You know what it means to follow Jesus? You follow him in the quietness of the voice of the Spirit that speaks his will into your heart. Sometimes the things that you call blessing, just like I, I was en route to a promotion, two weeks to write an examination and be promoted to an estimable level in my establishment. And then the voice of Jesus now comes. Resign now. You follow him in the quietness of the voice of his spirit that reveals his will in your heart. So if I ask you, because according to Jesus, what it means to live from the statement Jesus made in the book of Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You do not live by bread only. You also live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So if I ask you now, do you have a diary where you have written down the things he told you and you are doing them? I can show you diaries dating back to the 90s. Diaries dating back to the 80s. Things that God spoke and I am walking in them till today. That's his prescription of life. Words that proceed out of the mouth of God. That's how we follow him. That's how we follow him. I had invitations the other time. I had invitations to preach in uh, about nine countries. So I went to him and said, are you the one that opened these doors? He told me he's not aware of any door. As a preacher... Does an open door mean that God is asking you to do something? If your life is based on open doors, it means that Satan will soon open some and get you into places that God never intended that you will go. So I went to him. The next day, next year, you know, I had nine doors open. I checked with him. He said, uh, sorry, I, I didn't open any door. Then the next year, I had 12 doors open. Went to him, he said, I didn't open any door. So the other year, I didn't go to him again. Then he now told me that, hey, I opened one. 
And the one he opened was the worst one. The, it's not a place. <laughs> but that was the first time I knew what it felt like to be sent by God. First time in my life. That God said, go in my name. Yeah. First meeting, I, the first time I saw miracles, um, crippled people walk in public meetings. First time. They... The time before that time that I saw a crippled person work was in home cell meeting, home cell. And they brought a crippled girl and I couldn't sit down. The, my body, ah, I couldn't. Something was saying, go and raise her up. I, I said, can you calm down? Can you calm down? <laughs> can you calm down? Because I was not the one coordinating the meeting. So I don't have any authority to do that. So before they closed the meeting, they now gave me the mic and said, can you round up? Ah, I just went to the line and said, Jesus said, stand up. <laughs> Guess what? She did not just stand instantly. She fell. She fell down. I said, no, Jesus didn't say follow. Jesus said, stand up and what? Walk. She fell down again the second time. I now discovered why she was falling. She knew she would fall. So she used to hold the seat. So I now threw the seat away and pushed her. I didn't answer again. She staggered and began to walk. So that was the first time I saw a cripple. But it was home cell. You, you know the home cell environment is controlled. It's hidden. That crusade I went for, to that one country, the country I didn't like, that Jesus sent me to, I saw what Jesus does through people that he sends. First time I saw five crippled people walk in a meeting. That was the first time. The second service, 30 deaf ears open. That was the first. In fact, that was the first time I saw deaf here. And it was 30 of them. Because Jesus sent me. He began to teach me about what it means to be a sent one, an apostle. That's the first time. And after going for that trip, I came back. He refused that I should go for any foreign trip again. Until what year was that? He cut me off. He just said, I want you to see. Come back. Stay at home. Meanwhile, those people that I preached for invited me the next day. They said, call me. He was no longer sending me. I was in the wilderness for so long that I wasn't even hoping to be sent again. When I didn't hope to be sent, he said, now, resign. You will go for me. And since then, I've walked in the calling of an apostle, a sent one from Jesus. Follow him. Follow his voice. His voice should be your wisdom. His voice should be what determines what you choose, what your strategy is, how you operate, when you sleep, when you wake up. His voice should drive it. His voice should drive it. And when his voice begins to drive your life, you are following him. You deny yourself. You take up, you accept the sacrifice that is associated with serving his will. Hallelujah. For some of you, the sacrifice is in your giving. He comes and says, all right, I will be blessing you, but you give me 60% of all you earn. And that's your cross. See to it that you are faithful. See to it that you are faithful. It's your personal cross. Before you get married, tell your wife, and if the cross came to you after you got married, go and submit to your husband. Say, he came. If he wants, he can go and check if what you are saying is true. But do not be a crossless Christian in the name of Jesus Christ. The fifth principle is one that we know. Pray without ceasing. The way of life requires prayer on end prayer on end prayer on end hmm? so I'm going to stop there um, the last principle of life within the limit of my own study and research is honoring the lordship of Christ in your life and in the body of Christ I will explain that briefly we'll continue tomorrow you honor the Lordship of Christ in your life. I am 
striving. I am striving to be faithful. I'm striving to serve my Lord. So any strand of his will that I'm aware of becomes a command that is built into my life. This is why I'm living. I'm living to obey him. Are you there? May he be important enough for you to be able to obey. You honor his lordship in your life and you honor his lordship in the body. Now, if I'm saying that I'm honoring the lordship of Jesus in the body, I can identify people apart from myself in the body of Christ that are walking straight with God. And I recognize the grace that they carry. And it happens to be that the principle that supports the body of Christ is the principle of interdependence. So I cannot know all things that are needed to prosecute my destiny. Some will come from Pastor Ayer. Some will come from, from Israel. Some will come from Toby. As long as these people are right with God, I recognize what they represent in the body of Christ. Not just who they are, but what God has made them to the body. Because through that which they are in the body of Christ, I can draw strength from my life. When Pastor Ayo comes to me, visits me in Makodi, I'm not receiving him as Pastor Ayo. I'm receiving him as a man that God has raised as a prophet to his body in these end times. Hallelujah. I'm expecting that before our time of fellowship, that the Lord will quicken him to confirm some dealings that I'm having in the privacy of my heart. I'm believing that God will do that. Because that's the kind of grace that he carries. I recognize him according to what God has made him in the body. Are you with me? A time came in the body of Christ where there were no more evangelists. No more. Nobody has the calling of an evangelist anymore. Because every evangelist became either an apostle or a pastor. And even in the body of Christ, it became difficult to identify what this person was originally called to do because he's doing something else. I'm praying that we'll find enough courage to be what God has ordained us to be in the body of Christ. It, that it will be clear that this is what this person is and is operating the way Jesus has prescribed. Not that he's operating a way that he's looking for how to secure his life. No. Because if you begin to, if your calling is genuine, but the strategy by which you are accomplishing the call is not Jesus' strategy, there's a level to which you cannot grow in that call. Yes. And the role you are supposed to play in the body of Christ will remain vacant because your strategy is not approved. You know, life will determine the way and what and the result. We are going to pray in tongues for two minutes so that I can go high. So every day when I wake up, I say, Jesus, I'm not ashamed of this cross I'm carrying. Because I have friends all over the world. If somebody insults me on Facebook, one of them will just cut it and just send it to me. See? Somebody, somebody, is, somebody just woke up and... <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, before the person woke up, I had woken up. And I told Jesus, I'm not ashamed of this sacrifice. I know it and I'm, it's a joy, it's a privilege for me to be considered worthy of bearing this reproach for the name of Jesus Christ. You know, when, when, they, when they gave the disciples, they gave them some strokes and they came out of the place, they were expecting that they would be broken. Because as they gave them those strokes, they now gave them a charge never to talk again in the name of Jesus. They came out of the place, they were rejoicing. The, those guys that beat them up would have said, these guys are mad. The people of this world, if you are accurate with Jesus, the people of this world will not be able to understand why you do the things you do. The reason is because you have another audience that you want to please. Your first audience is Jesus. So I'd already woken up and told him, I'm not ashamed of your cross. It is a privilege. Yes, it's the, it's, it is the revelation 
of my value, of my essence. This cross, that I have a place of suffering in you. Ah! It means you have designed that I will be great in your sight. Every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, like that. As you begin to walk with God, then the shape of your calling, the significance of your rising begins to down on you. And it's downing on you, accurate men in the spirit will still be speaking it to you. Then you begin to see the responsibility. If ministry is still sweet for you, because you are, you are don't worry, enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> because a time will come as your shape begins to come out. You begin to design your cross. And that cross, you will need to bear it as you follow him. You don't follow him without a cross. The badge, the identity, the way you are supposed to be when you are following him is with your sacrifice. Because he is the king of sacrifice. And all his true followers, there is a part of that sacrifice that is allocated to each and every one of us. If at any point in time you are dispossessed of that sacrifice, it means you are a false Christian. Are you there? I am happy about the cross. I am happy. I'm happy about the sacrifice. It is an indication of the fact that you have plans for me. You want me to be great in your sight. You want to be able to look upon me and be proud. May the things that God sees that touches him be the things that touches our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. In a moment, in a moment, in a moment, we want to make a decision because Adam was faced with a decision. Will I eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Will I eat of the tree of life? What will I eat from? Because what you eat will determine the lines of your development. What you eat will determine how you develop. Whether you are a creature that is totally relevant to God or a creature that is relevant to God. I want to help you with that choice. Can you tell God in your prayer, I choose the tree of life. I choose to be dependent on you. I choose to deny myself every time the option rises for me to walk in the flesh, for me to gratify myself. I choose the way of denier, to deny myself every day, to deny myself every day, so that your spirit will have liberty to reign, to rule in my life. That there will be no question as to where my allegiance is. There will be no question as to where, where my loyalty is. It will be obvious that I live for you that I live for you, that every moment that I wake up on my bed, I'm waking up for you, not for myself, but for you, and to serve your will. I will never be ashamed of the cross that you have placed upon me. I will never be ashamed of the cross that you have placed upon my life. That sacrifice that is attributed to my calling, that sacrifice that is part and parcel of my calling, that I'm going to bear all the days of my life in honor of your name in honor of your suffering in honor of what you did for me that sacrifice i will never be ashamed of it i will never be ashamed of it i will never be ashamed of it. somebody needs to make some some dedication some powerful statements that will tie you to jesus afresh in this house oh my god oh my god i'm not seeking the pleasures that this world can give. I'm not seeking the pleasures that this generation can give. I'm not seeking the accolades. I'm not seeking the claps of my generation but i seek to please you i seek to satisfy your will to fulfill your counsel for my life that's what i live for i want to walk on the path of life i want to navigate on the path of life i want to operate with you as my source in every decision in every strategy in everything that i do lord that the principles of life will be the principles that characterize is my existence. I cannot hear you. I cannot hear somebody. Yeah. 
You know that that guy is an unbeliever, but yet you are still dating him. You are still, you, you have not yet. You are still on the broad path. You are still on the broad path. You have not yet signed up for the path of life. But David said, Thou will show us the path of life. Thou will show us the path of life. He will show us the path of life. He is okay, let back on him, Mama Talia. He is coping the low brusco to Lisa. Lord, do not get, do not allow me to be mixed up with my age and lost with my age, with the fantasies of my age. But let it be, oh God, that every step of the way, every day of my life, I will live soberly with my under the weight of the cross that you have given me. And I will glorify you in that cross. And I will glory in that cross because by that cross, I serve your will perpetually and you are the elevated spectacle of your will someone needs to make a commitment tonight I will never violate any of your laws in order for me to gain any form of carnal advantage. I will stay with you. I will win by righteousness. I will stand on your principles. Is it not written that thy throne is forever and ever because the scepter of thy right scepter. Sako Bokolia Busa Selikendo Hombre Kete Bokosi Kaba Onde Muria Seti Bambro Kombe Nazika Bagadulia Ampekus Eteke Esakuria Bahalate The mixtures in our day is too much in the body of Christ. We seek men of sufficient stature. Men whose goal is to please the Lord, for thou will show me the path of life, for thou will show me the path of life. For in thy presence there is fullness of joy. I will strive, I will strive every day, I will strive to be an object of pleasing in thy sight I will strive for in you my life consists every meaning that I have you is in you it was derived from you it was revealed by you so I live for you I live for you I live for you I am willing to put myself in the place of disadvantage if only it will serve your will christianity weakens christianity weakens in nigeria day after day year after year because christ is no longer the focus it's a gospel of compromise to raise compromised people without conviction but we rise as a remnant and we say our goal is to please our commanding officer satula <laughs> Amparakatala, Ibrosko Begabuska Tabina, I compande Kelobose, Brakatusa, and the Kuria Bamande. I deny myself. I deny myself. I deny myself so that I can be selfless enough to be a conduit pipe for your spirit to flow out like many rivers i deny myself 
I refuse to be a self-centered, self-seeking, small man in a big body. I deny myself so that I can be large for God, so that I can be big for God, so that I can be a warehouse of his power, a warehouse of his authority, a warehouse of his grace. I deny myself. I deny myself. Do you know your cross? Are you willing to bear it? Are you willing to carry it? Are you willing to walk with it? Many are willing to exchange it for something else in this age. But I will exchange mine for a crown. A crown in his presence. Nothing will take away my cross. I embrace it. I am willing to go on and on on the path of sacrifice to the glory of his name among all nations thank you lord in the name of jesus it says, because thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Now, many of us love righteousness, but we don't hate wickedness. And that's why the average Christian can always easily compromise with the knowledge that he can always take advantage of the blood of Jesus. So that, why do people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say we are not careful to answer you concerning this matter? Couldn't they have denied and bowed down and then they go back and repent? We have raised a bunch of compromising people that cannot take their stand. Meanwhile, Jesus said, don't be afraid of the person that can kill your body. If you need to fear somebody, be afraid of the one that can kill your soul in the fires of hell. Do you hate wickedness? I want us to pray today that God will put a very strong hatred for wickedness. Many things we are, we are involved with is on the edge of compromise. On the edge because you don't hate wickedness. It's on the edge of compromise. If we do an analysis of the relationship you have kept for the past two years, it's on the edge of compromise. Several principles were broken. You accepted several things that Jesus was not happy about. But the day of the Puritans, that day comes again. Yes. When men can say, if I die, I die, because of what they have with Jesus. They are not willing to have a day in their lives where his heart is broken on their account. Such forceful people in their faith that the devil cannot intimidate, he can't, no system can manipulate. Concerning this matter, we are not careful. We thought about it all night. We are not careful. Give me a hatred for wickedness. Someone needs to cry. When you stand direct, then the things that fight you will become small. I know the power of God. I know the hand of God. If only we can stand before him erect, he will raise one of us. Oh my God. I 
can use him to become an instrument of salvation to many people. Hate compromise. Hate compromise with passion. I am an agency of righteousness. I am a man of righteousness, a woman of righteousness. I hate wickedness with passion. I hate it with passion. Because God has a plan for me. I am one of those instruments that he will use to bring salvation into the land, into the nation. I'm all for him. I'm all on his side. I walk in the principles of life, the principles of life. Every day when when self comes with a suggestion, I deny it. I deny the opportunity to express itself through my vessel because I'm sold out. I'm sold out to him. I am sold out to him. Every day when I'm confronted with circumstances that exalt me beyond him, I deny self. It is not about me. It is not about my pleasure. It's about him. Sevila compe que escovila cabela y sufria. Mahabo se que tan de galis. Presco bocoto bocoria babasinte. Ando bobo rebosico brata babore. Alla la la mama sia carne. That's how we become incurable messengers of light. Incurable. We hate wickedness as much as we love righteousness. So he can send us to neutralize the darkness that is rising in the age. He can send us to neutralize the darkness rising in our families. He can send some of us into political offices and then it will become clear that there's nothing wrong with politics. We make a stand for you today. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. He said, I put before you this day life and death. Blessing and cursing. I wrote something in my book. And this is the question. By what parameters do you judge? Do you judge according to right and wrong? Do you judge according to good and evil? There is a higher judgment that God is calling us to judge from. He's judging according to life and death. The argument is not right and wrong. It's deeper than that. The argument is not good, good and evil. Is it good? Is it not? No. Because sometimes even Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. It's not, 
it will look right. That's not the argument. The argument is what? Life and what? Death. That's the argument. And people that traffic death and they want to make the body of Christ. I hope you know a church can die. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Yes, so the, the, a church, the church in a nation can be dead. And agencies of death that are ministers of death whose source is Satan. They are quick to cry out. When you see somebody doing something wrong, shut up! So that death will have a field day. I feel it. If we hate righteousness as much as, hate wickedness as much as we love right, righteousness, you can't shut up. Because according to scriptures, it is the amount that must be stopped. Are you, are you there? So they will do everything on earth to, to try to intimidate you if, if it works. Oh, I see their beggarly efforts. We are not here on an analysis of good and evil, right and wrong. What we are dealing with is what? Is life and death. Death has been creeping in. Many people are victims of death. In the body, I'm not talking about outside because messengers of death came in unchecked. The current ministry civilization is just to accept death, you know, be, be, be um, civilized. Don't, no, that was not how the apostles operated. The reason why we can accommodate darkness and not challenge it is because we love righteousness and we don't hate wickedness. We're not talking about right and wrong. Don't get us wrong. Not good or, and evil. No. It's what? Life versus what? Death. Please know that. The only merchandise we have is life. We'll preach about it. We'll talk about it. We'll leave it. We'll follow its principles because its end result is definite. When you decide to align with life. It is the hand of God that will lift you by himself. God himself will do what? God himself will be responsible for your visibility. God himself will cause your voice to travel. I know somebody wants to be great in the sight of God. Huh? Yes, that's me. That's me. Many of you that came for this conference this weekend, God will do something in your life that you know that only God could have done this. So you watch it and see. Only God. The God of the house of Israel is great. It's not as beggarly as we have known God to be. No, it is lack of alignment that has diminished his capacity in our camp. He is mighty on behalf of his people. He calls his house back to the place of loyalty. He calls his, back, his house back to the place of life. That we will wander out of every strategy and every way of death and stand only where life is. And he will make us strong by himself. He will make us have capacity by himself. He will make us overcome by himself. I want to pray for us. Will we do healing, deliverance, all of that tomorrow evening? But I, I felt this burden. Forgive me, um, Pastor Austin. You say we should talk about the ministry of the world. I have my, I have my notes for that. Eh? So tomorrow morning, maybe if the Lord settles on that, we will begin to talk about the ministry of the world and prayer. But remember, we have what? We can test along the line of source of principles. So if we see the principles you're operating, we can know where what you ate. If it's the tree of life or the tree of death. If we see the laws that govern your operation. If the Lord 
permit, we'll go into laws tomorrow. If it doesn't, then we'll go into the ministry of the world. The laws, kingdoms, and lines. We can actually draw debt from the beginning, draw a line of debt from the beginning and draw it to the Antichrist in the end. You will see debt. It's a long line that features in every age, in every era, in every dispensation, in every aeon. Debt. And we can also draw a line for, of life. You will see Christ in David as the conquering king. You will see Christ in Solomon as the reigning king. You will see that line. We can draw it and you will see the pattern clearly to the end. So what I'm talking to you about is a pathway towards recovery using the instrument of discernment. So anywhere the Lord will want us to go tomorrow, where we go, maybe we'll take a snapshot at the, I'll pray about it, we'll know what it is. But you see, God is calling his church back to loyalty, to absolute, absolute loyalty. So that we will vomit every strand of the, tree, of the bad tree that we have eaten. Ev vomit everything. And then we'll start eating right. Huh? Some of us are obese on the wrong food. Obey is on debt. We are going to vomit it. And we are coming back to eat right. So that we can fulfill his will. We can carry out his demands. And we can bear his cross. Glorifying in the privilege. Father, in the name of Jesus, just like you have witnessed to my heart, so have I proclaimed your counsel. 